Hey, let me say before we start that I um, I watched uh, Rabbi Weeder his last uh, set, last of his five classes, and I think that uh, our Monday night classes inspired that because I kept quoting him, and I think that's when uh, I think so. That's when Rabbi Kelman said uh, we should have him, and I have to say it's a tour de force. Uh, what he did, five classes. There's nothing like it uh, online, that's for sure. Uh, and that's, as I told him after already the first class, I said, I'm never laning again because you see the expertise that be a really excellent Balkori. Wow, what yeah. you got to know. So uh, I think, I think at least that we inspired it here. If we didn't, but, uh, but uh, I think we did. So that's great. Okay, everyone, uh, just a couple things. So we got great stuff as always. Uh, I just want to correct something. I, I spoke with Shulam Roth. It was the he was rabbi in Chernovitz. It was in Lvov that uh, he had to withdraw if he his Mizrahi uh, involvement if he wanted it. I mentioned um, Ibn Tibon. Here's a famous guide for the perplexus translation, and I said that some words he invented. If you look in the back, it's uh, he has Perush uh, Mehamilot Zarot. And just to give you a couple of words that Ibn Tibon invented, you might be surprised, siur, as meaning like uh, imagination, but also merkaz. We all know the word merkaz, center. That was, that's, that's Ibn Tibon. Um, he used, we have the root, reish chamiz chavzayim, and uh, he, that's one of the words that he invented. So you can check that out. Uh, let me put this over here. Um, okay, someone, uh, I think Shmuel is his name, uh, wrote me an, a, a, an email. We have lots of people listening in the old classes, and he wants to know, um, you know, I, we, we, those who were with us in the early classes, we did a lot on TikTok and uh, all sorts of uh, interesting stuff. At least I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting. Uh, uh, I know Susanna thinks it's interesting <laughs> looking at it, but he wants to know, first of all, well, what is this? Isn't this just for the Sfardim and do Ashkenazim really care? And he says, does God really care? And I said, well, first of all, it's nothing to do with God caring. God knows what we're doing, but if it's, you're supposed to pronounce it properly. If I tell you that President Biden, you know who I'm referring to, but I'm mispronouncing his name. But then he, he said, but do, he's been to yeshiva, do any Ashkenazim really care about this anymore? And the truth is he's probably right. You mostly find this in the Sephardic world, but not exclusively. I mean, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky felt it important, but if you look historically, you have, you have your Yaakov Emdin, Rav Shabtai Sofer, and you have the Gra, the Vilna Go. So of course, this has been important in the Ashkenazic world. And I wanna show you people something now, uh, um, which I didn't share with him, but I'll, um, I just wanna call your attention to it. Uh, there's a book called Ali Osel Yahu, uh, which was written about, uh, I think it was published, um, in the 1850s by Rishu Hashalev. And it's a hagiography of uh, the Gro, the Vilna Go. And uh, this is the new edition, it's on page 96. I want you to look um, in the note here, note 75, it says as follows, that uh, the, the, the Av Bastin, the rabbi of the city of Kedan in Lithuania told me that when the Vilna Go uh, was in his youth, he came to Kedan and uh, he, he was there uh, making sure that the children will learn in the Talmud Torah, and especially that they learn the difference between Mila'el and Mila'ra, that what we spoke about, that is words that um, the syllable is the penultimate, the second to the end versus the, the end, so that they can pronounce it properly. And then he said as follows, and let's see if anyone can figure out what this means and type it in in the chat, if you do know. Uvescholkamar, and jokingly the Gross said, lo amru devar emes me'olam. The Gross says, based upon what, you know, how the kids sound, lo amru devar emet, emet me'olam. Lo amru devar emes me'olam. What does he mean? Anyone know when he says that the children, lo amru devar emet me'olam? What the Gross means here? Any, anyone have an idea? If not, I'll explain it to you what he means. It's the, it's the, the Vilnagon's joking. Lo, he says about these children, lo amru dvar emes leolam. Dvar emet, it's a big, oh, let me see here. Uh, uh, Got to see the chat here. No, no, no one got it. Um, okay, what he means is as follows. Uh, oh, so one more person sent it in, let's see. Uh, no, uh, what it means is as follows. 
they were pronouncing the word MS. But it's supposed to be pronounced MS, or in Sephardic, Emet, but MS. So when it says, Lo Amru Devar MS Leolam, they never spoke truth. He's playing on that expression that appears in Tanakh Devar MS because they never said MS. They only said MS. So that was the film. And remember, she just said before that they have to learn the difference between Mila'el and Mila Ra. And he joked and said, until now, they've never said Devar MS or Devar MS. I don't know how he pronounced it in their life because they always, they would say MS. They would say, they would always get the words uh, wrong. So that's the first thing um, I want to show you. Um, take that, uh, was it Shmuel or Shomo to, uh, we'll turn that off to, uh, <laughs> to your Ashkenazic uh, Roshi Yeshivas. Incidentally, uh, I found also uh, the Ben Ishchai says the same, we spoke about the Gra, and I'm gonna bring you some stuff about the Gra also in a future class. But the Ben Ishchai also uses the word I found Hazot, Laila Hazot. He has a whole thing about this. and. Um, so it's not just the grot. Okay, uh, someone emailed me about the, the, the dancing, the young Israel dancing. So well, I don't wanna get too much into this, uh, but um, let me show you something else. I just Googled it and what comes up uh, from 1934, October, an article from the JTA, the young Israel Bronx Gardens was having their um, annual dance. But then, and of course we all know this is common, this is popular, but then, as I'm Googling, looking around, I come across an article by the indefatigable Zev Elif, a touchy subject, a short history of the rise and fall of orthodox social dancing. So you can uh, read all you want on it, but he pointed out something I didn't know, which is fascinating. If you recall, we, um, let me get rid of this, we spoke about the Masmid, which is the Yeshiva College uh, uh, yearbook. So here we have the Masmid from 1936. And uh, if you look in it, you see all sorts of great stuff. Here, by the way, is the tennis team at Yeshiva College in uh, 1936. Uh, if you look at the pictures, you see the guys uh, didn't wear yarmulkes when they were outside. It's sort of like this German yucky uh, idea that they only have to wear it inside because there's plenty of pictures where they don't have it. Um, Oh, and there's a picture of Mo Fjorstein for those people from Boston who I mentioned before. He was in that uh, graduating class. But what uh, Zev Elif called attention to is a couple of pages before on this, on Yeshiva College uh, yearbook, talks about how the junior year, take a look at this, the junior class. Last year, the class had as the first social affair, a dance at the Peter Stuyvesant Hotel. What I can assure you of without any fear of being contradicting is the Yeshiva College now is not having dances, they're not putting in the yearbook and it never would be allowed. But in 1936, uh, there you go. Thank you, uh, Zev Elif, uh, for taking us uh, down memory lane. One more thing I wanna share with you guys. Um, I was reading, uh, I was reading this book just came out because we're talking a lot about today about Rav Mazuz in the next uh, few weeks. Um, Kovetz Mamari, two volumes of articles, all sorts of great stuff. And on volume, um, uh, let's see, it's in volume one, page 386. He says, he gets back to the idea of the Rambam that we were speaking about against anthropomorphisms. And he quotes from a book by one of the most strange and interesting people we've had. He's a, I just gotta show you this picture. So, uh, some of you will know this person. There he is. You ever, you ever heard of uh, Raphael, what is he, Raphael Halperin? Raphael Halperin was a rabbi. He grew up, he was very close to the Chazonish. He even wrote a book about the Chazonish um, and his relationship. But he became a wrestler, like a fake wrestler. Uh, you can see, um, here's a uh, picture of him. Uh, you see, in his, he used to wear a star, a star of David. You can even see a, uh, a video of him. Uh, let's see, hold on a second. Of him wrestling. He was a firm guy. Here he is, Rafal Halpern. And again, after he retired from wrestling, he had a couple of businesses and he wrote a number of sfarim, including a safer on, uh, 
a very like three volumes I think on Rashi every because he was descended from Rashi everything you wanted about Rashi, and he wrote all sorts of good stuff. Um, so you can look him up later. Well, oh, oh before we go further, I, I want to show you this is uh, well I'll get back to him in a second uh, after I do Rafael Halpern. So he wrote a parish on Chumash. And he wrote a parish, and the people who are older probably remember uh, Rafael Hopper, he gave a lot of pride, he was Mr. Israel, uh, the, Rus Rus the wrestling rabbi, all these sorts of things. Uh, but he wrote a parish called Diyukin Batora, and in volume um, one, page 26, he asks, he writes that he speaks about the Kedas Yitzchak, it says there's a midrash that the angels, their tears fell into the eyes of Yitzchak. So he asked the question, now, well, how is that possible? Angels uh, don't have tears. Uh, they're, uh, do angels have tears? And uh, Rabbi Mazuz in his uh, commentary and his article says about this, he, he, he calls him a Chacham Helperin with uh, Zal, but then he says to him, I don't get the question. And if um, angels uh, had tears, they still would be falling in Yitzhak's eyes. Aren't the angels far up? Uh, and he goes off, he goes, so how, would the angel, how would the tears have come from all the way up in heaven? And, and then he says, listen, he says, if Halpern, Rabbi Halpern, uh, would actually study Lomed Umarich and really understand and respect the Rambam, he wouldn't have any of these problems because he'd understand that all these things about, these are all mashal umelitsa, that the sages are not speaking literally when they say that they the angels have tears or the tears fall in. You wouldn't have these questions. Uh, he says, if you weren't a little Rambam, you know that all these anthropomorphisms that don't just refer to God, they refer to the angels. You don't ask questions like this because you miss the whole point. And that's that's what he says about uh, how, uh, Halpern. <laughs> you know, there's another uh, from an Orthodox family strong man. Anyone ever hear of this guy? Zisha Breitbart? He was known as the strongest man in the world. He comes from an Orthodox family. They even made a uh, movie about him, Invincible in 2001. You can read all about him in, um, uh, in many places on Evo. He, I'm gonna show you something else now. You know where he was buried? He was, and here's his tombstone. I don't know if you can see it that well. He was buried in the Adas Yisrael Cemetery in Berlin. I've been going to Berlin before COVID all the time since 1990. The first time I was there in 1990 when it was still East Germany. I even knocked down a piece of the wall, which if I was home, I'd show you. But he's from the Adas community. The, the Orthodox, Israel Hildesheimer, David C. Hoffman. In fact, in the cemetery, David C. Hoffman's buried, Avram Elio Kaplan's buried. And I don't know if you can read it. It says, um, it says, Harbei Kavod Imo, Bigvura Tov, oh no. And, you know, he had all this strength. So that's uh, Zisha Breitbart, uh, probably Andrew Breitbart from Breitbart News. He was adopted. He wasn't Jewish, although he's adopted by Jewish parents. Uh, they, maybe they converted him. I don't never heard they converted from Orthodox, but uh, maybe he's descended. The la and the last thing I want to show you before we begin, because I forgot to mention, is about the dancing, is um, this is Rabbi Solomon Maimon, who was a rabbi in uh, Seattle. He just died like last year uh, at I think age 100. Uh, he's the first uh, Sephardic Musmach, as far as I know, from Yeshiva College, going back uh, to the uh, early 40s, I believe. Uh, um, and he gave all his sons, you know, Haredi type education, didn't even send them to YU, uh, to Yeshiva, to MTA, sent them to the Haredi schools. But he gave an interview shortly before he died, The Secret to a Successful Sephardic Community, and he says as follows, and he said it, he didn't just do it, he actually spoke about it. I'll just read it to you. Members of Seattle's Sparta community occasionally reflect on a time when synagogues held dances for the youth, something taboo today. Rabbi Maimon wasn't sure that co-ed programming was right, but he knew it was what he had to do to get the kids coming back. He offered a story about a Sukkot event where he ordered the youth to go to a dance in the social hall. I'm going to lock it and nobody gets out until they have a date, he recalled. That's what happened. They came for Sukkot, they got a date, they had a dance afterwards, and we served them good stuff. It's a powerful example of the rabbi meeting the community where it was and seeking a creative solution to the never ending problem of Jewish dating. On Yom Kippur, I repented, he said. I told God, I'm wrong, but you put me in charge here. And I say, I have to do wrong to get right. 
it's going to bring them to marry each other. And that's what uh, they did. So uh, listen, I'm not, again, I'm not the post speaker or anything, but uh, it's, it's easy to sit where we are in a very different world and uh, look at things, but uh, that's, uh, that's uh, what uh, he did. Uh, incidentally, uh, some have, um, when um, I came back to Zisha Breitbart, I say I wrote something down. He came in 1923 on an American tour and he was called Superman of the Ages. And some think that he inspired the, the Jewish people who created Superman, uh, he inspired him. Okay, everyone, let us now pick up. We are in the Sefer, Simon um, Kufma Mechet, 138, page 293. And um, I need to tell you a little, give you a little background to what we're doing now, because uh, the title of the, res, of the letter is, well, first of all, it's Redifat Nuat Yachad, the, uh, persecution of the uh, Yachad movement. And then Idi Yukim Betzitu Psukim Adei Rishonim, Rishonim who quote biblical verses inaccurately. But first, what is Yachad? Yachad, Rav Avad Yosef passes away in 2013. And um, shortly after that, about a, year, a little more than a year at the beginning of 2015, there's new elections for the Israeli uh, Knesset. Uh, Aryeh Deri, who was corrupt, probably still is corrupt. He went to jail. When he went to jail, Eli Yishai, he was really a simple person. He's not a Tamafach, he's not a rabbi like Derry uh, in the army, but uh, a very honest, uh, low-key sort of person. He ran um, Shas with Ravadia, and uh, there never was a hint of scandal with him. I mean, Shas has had a problem. They've had a lot of people uh, serving time. <laughs> uh, but when Aryeh Derry gets out, whatever it is, uh, Ravadia was convinced that uh, he did his time. Okay. Um, to, uh, to uh, allow him back in to run the show. And uh, he was then exiled, as it were, uh, Eli Yishai, because he won't, couldn't work with Aryeh Derry. So when the Knesset elections were going to be in 2015, Yishai came up with an idea, a plan, that uh, he would start a new party. The question was, who's the, um, I guess, the, uh, the, who's carrying on the message of Rav Vadi Yosef? Is it the Shas party? which is now basically have run by Rav Shalom Cohen and Rav David Yosef, and which really became completely Haredi, they thought. Uh, as I mentioned before, Rav Shalom Cohen said all sorts of crazy things. He called the people where Kippas through Gaz as, uh, as a Malik. Uh, he referred to, uh, he said, we don't need an army. All we need is tefillah. I mean, all sorts of um, uh, unbelievable stuff. Well, Eli Yishai wants to be back in Knesset. So he comes up with the idea that he's going to create a coalition, a coalition of people, Sfardim, who are fed up with Shas because it doesn't represent them. Obviously, Shas and Sfardim support the army, things like that. And also the right wing religious Zionists, the, uh, the, what we call the Khardali. And he means both sides of the Khardali, the, um, the, the Ravavinair types, or the Mamakhti. And also Rav Dovlior types uh, who are, uh, I guess we don't call them Mamachti, but all, or the, all the Hardali. And he thought that this could be a, a nice winning coalition. The problem was that not all the Hardali went along, some went to, with another party, uh, but for a while it looked like this would be a very powerful um, uh, party and they would get in and everyone was building up uh, Rav Mazuz as the next Maran. In fact, they made uh, they made vi movies, they made videos, and there was all sorts of discussions because there no was, was no um, real um, I guess charismatic person in Shas. The question was though, would they would the fact that this is Ravad Yosef's party, even if he's not here anymore, would there still be the nostalgia and the loyalty? Because the only reason the Shas party got so many people is because traditional Sephardim were not really orthodox, the way we think of it, they voted for him. So let me just show you some of the things that came out. It was a very dirty election. The Shas party has, does all sorts of dirty tricks. Uh, we don't need to get involved with them in a minute, but let me just show you, just to give you an example uh, of how they portrayed. Uh, so here is, um, Here's one of the, the, the movies, they made three to two like movies and their videos. And the idea was to make, portray Rav Mazuz and therefore obviously the, uh, the, the Yachad party as the true successor to the Shas party. It's like today, Agudas Yisrael in Israel, they say Yadus HaTorah 
or Degola Torah, that, that's the true, before there was a joint, that Degola Torah, that's the true successor to the Gudas Yisrael, because the Gudas Yisrael split. So here I'll just play for you for just to get a sense of how they were trying to, like a cult of personality, I guess you could say, rose up around Rav Mazuz, and they were going to use him, because what happened was that uh, Eli Yishai, he went to Rabbi Mazuz, He's Tunisian himself, that uh, Rav Mazuz would be the leader and they convinced Rav Mazuz to leave the base Medrash. Every day he was going speaking at different places. It's a bracha that the, the Yachad party never passed. They, 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 they got 123,000 votes. They never, they, if 10,000 more, they would have been in the Knesset. But it's, it's really a bracha because uh, we don't want the Gdolim, I think, uh, being involved in politics every day. They should be spending their time learning Torah and giving shurim and writing, but they, they came close. It showed, I guess, the, the weakness of the, um, the Chardalim, that they couldn't, uh, they couldn't pull through. But here, for example, here's one of the videos. So you see, it's obvious, and then it's a whole video, you can watch it. They came up with another video also. Uh... Yeah. Actually, that's just a song, not a video. And then there was a third one. Who, who has three songs written about them? I don't know of any songs that Rabbi Vadya even has, but the, the Tunisians are very attached to Rabbi Mazuz and... Uh, so this is another song that came up. This was after the election, no, uh, but I, I like the song. Uh. So if you want later, you can listen uh, to some of the music. But uh, it became, as I said, very dirty, the election. And uh, this was when, um, <laughs> during the election, um, video came out of Ravad Yosef uh, speaking to his people about how uh, uh, the, the stupidity of Arya Dari really knocking him. But uh, uh, we don't know who released that. Obviously, someone from the family. But it became, as I said, quite a dirty election. And uh, Yitzhak Yosef, the Rishon Metzion, who in my book, oh, there's letters from him, he really came out very strongly against Rabbi Mazuz. Sephardic society was split and remains split. There's two, um, I guess, circles in the Sephardic world. You have Rabbi Mazuz, the leader of one, with Rav Amar, Shomo Amar, and many other rabbis. And then you have Rav Shalom Cohen, Rav Yitzhak Yosef, Rav David Yosef uh, on the other side. And uh, really, the Sephardic community is split. The Yachad party, its whole point was Yachad, that we're all together. They took out ads with a kippah struga and a black kippah. And uh, Rav Mazuz said that Shas, the Shas party, should stand for Shin, Black Shachar Kippa and also uh, Kippa Sruga Samech. So they tried to uh, have this unity. But I want to play you now just for a minute. If you if you understand Hebrew, you'll hear what Rav Yitzhak Yosef says about uh, Rabbi uh, Mazuz, and you get a sense of how bitter this has become and remains really to this day. If and I'll translate afterwards. מרן השאיר מורשת אחריו, ויש כאלו בבני ברק שרוצים לעקוב את המורשת של הרב, ומחברים ספרים, ערבים ועשמות, כל מיני ירחונים רוצים כל חודש, וכל זה לא נועד אלא לגדל את שבם ולהוריד את הפסקים של מרן. זה, זה המצב היום, יש מלחמה כזו, שחס ושלום להשכיח את תורתו של מרן. זה היה אחד, היה אחד שאמר בקול חי, זה רק אחד, סיפרו לי שהוא אמר חמש מאות שנה לא קם כמו מה שבבני ברק, לא רוצה. חמש מאות שנה לא קם כמו, מה חמש מאות שנה? מרן לא היה גדול הדור, מה קרה פתאום? שכחתי את הכל, הם רוצים להשכיח. 
So from the standpoint of the of the Rav Avad Yosef's son, the whole me- approach of Rav Mazuz is to uproot the Psakim of the Rav Avad Yosef. Now, it's not true. It is not true. And uh, in uh, the Kisei Rachim Yeshiva, that's the only yeshiva in the world where they study as a seder, the Abiyah Omer. And when all these other Rosh Yeshiva were attacking Rav Avad Yosef, it was only in Kisei Rachim that they supported him. And Rav Avad Yosef was the president of Yeshiva Kisei Rachim. However, it is true that Rav Mazuz does not accept all of Chacham Avadi's psakim, and he doesn't accept all of his views uh, on political matters. Rabbi Mazuz never became a, uh, was never on the Moetzis of um, Chachmei Torah of the Shas party because he never agreed with the, 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 the dovish positions of Rav Avad Yosef. But he wouldn't uh, disagree with him publicly, never. But he couldn't be on the Moetzet Gedolei Torah of the Shas party because they give the rubber stamp to everything Chacham Avad Yosef does. So the Shas party, for instance, um, abstained from Oslo. Rav Mazuz was very opposed to Oslo Accords. So he couldn't be on the Moetzet Chachmei Torah, but he, he never publicly opposed him. And he did not ever publicly oppose any Psakim of Chacham Avad Yosef. That's, I guess you could say that's a uh, great, uh, you know, respect. However, once Chacham Avad Yosef was Niftar, he doesn't feel that he needs to follow everything he says, and therefore he will tell, he will give his psaking, and he will, he's a right winger, he's a hawkish person. And uh, there, this, this great, you know, uh, being Mavatel himself was only during his lifetime. So when Chacham Yitzhak Yosef says that they are trying to uproot the heritage, it's not true, but there is some truth to that, because why should the Tunisians and why should the Moroccans uh, be bound to uh, Psakim of Chacham Avad Yosef uh, forever? And uh, so, yes, uh, they, when they speak about how in Kisei Rachamim, you know, he's the, he's, there hasn't been someone like him in hundreds of years, you can see that they'd be upset. Uh, so that, that's, and it was a very bitter election. So after the election was lost by the Yachad party, look, if I was in Israel, I don't think I'd vote for the Yachad party, even though I consider him my rabbi of sorts, uh, because uh, politically it doesn't align with me, I don't think, uh, a little too right wing. And I don't like the rabbis uh, getting involved so much. But nevertheless, it was upsetting to see how bitter it became. They brought everything out in the kitchen sink. Uh, the Shas people, took um, an old video of Rabbi Azuz in which he attacks the Chabad Messianics, and they portrayed him as being opposed to all Chabad Nikim. And, uh, and, it, and, therefore, and they brought it to Kfar Chabad so that uh, they would not get any votes from the Lubavitchers. They, they brought up stuff that is liberal view of conversion to try to get, I mean, it was, uh, they, they really, um, it, it, it's not good to see Balabatim, Askanim, trying to defame rabbis, but whatever it uh, happened. So I wrote him a letter saying how uh, upset I was to see that so-called Orthodox Jews could uh, fall to such a level where uh, they engage in uh, such behavior. Look, it's uh, Rabbi Mazuz was naive. And a lot of people are naive. If you're going to, politics is a rough and tumble business. It's a dirty business. If you don't, if you're not going to get in the gutter, then, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't be there. You need to you need to respond in kind. Uh, we know that uh, negative advertising uh, works. So I wrote him this, and then he writes back to me. This is in Tammuz of Tafshanai and Hey. Calls me Yedidinu um, Hayakar. He says, I um, haven't had time to respond to you until now. He says, from the, from the election until now, they continue to persecute us and everyone who's connected to us. They threw out students from yeshivos and, Avre- and uh, people studying in Kowell. Uh, who were working for Yachat. That's the way the Haredi work. They did it, they were also against the Peleg uh, group for Rabbi Auerbach. If you would work for a certain, po- the other political party, they throw you out of their yeshivas. As if we're a reform group or a branch of Mapam. And despite this, uh, on the other hand, he says, for Yair Lapid, they show him a good face and uh, they invite him to various events. He says that the hatred we've seen of the Haredim for other Haredim is worse than the hatred of the, um, the secularists for the Haredim. And we know that is the case. The battles, internal battles in the Haredi world, the way they fight with each other, it's worse than the way the secularists uh, oppose the Haredim. Uh, 
There's no hatred like you have from in the Haredi world, one to the other, unfortunately. But then he, said, then he says it's not going to help them. He quotes a pasuk from uh, Yehuda Levi's poetry. So I think this is actually an important letter because after the election, Rav Mazuz gave one speech that I know of. You can see it on the Yeshiva website in which he spoke about all the things they did and uh, how despite that, we didn't go in the gutter with them. And we're very proud of the fact that we got 120,000 votes. I mean, 120,000 votes. Everyone said afterwards, though, these are votes in the garbage, that these votes uh, could have gone uh, to one of the right-wing parties. Uh, but as far as I know, this is the only written document where he reflects on the loss. So one day when they write to the history of the Yachad party and Eli Yishai, I mean, he, he's finished his political career, although he served honorably, and, uh, uh, but uh, they will use this letter, I believe. And together with what I sent him, I also sent him, one of the ways Rabbi Mazuz was attacked, especially in the lead up to the election, is they argued that he has no respect for Gdolim. In other words, they tried, they had to tear down the, the, the leading figure, the spiritual leader. So they say he had, so they wrote, they had these magazines that came out saying he has no respect for Gdoli, citing all the different things he said. And one of the things he said is that Ramav Zuz in many time, places has pointed out that the Rishonim wrote many of their writings, their books from memory. How do we know that? Because they misquote Sukim. And there's plenty of examples of this. In my book, uh, Studies in Maimonides as Interpreters, I have it here, uh, no, I don't have a copy here. I give examples, many, many examples. And I actually think this is a positive thing. It shows how brilliant they were, the Rambam and others, that they knew everything by heart and they didn't copy it. They didn't bother looking, they just knew it by heart. So they make little mistakes sometimes. So uh, what, what's the alternative? You wanna say that they had a different version of Chumash? Is that more respectful? Uh, uh, we saw what Yaakov Chavonetsky suggested that, but no, they were citing from memory. And they, but they use this to show that Rabbi Mazuz doesn't respect Gedoli Yisrael because he says that they make mistakes and no. I mean, what else are you supposed to do? They're quoting a Pasuk, uh, uh, it's incorrect, but they would, they made a whole big thing. So he writes to me, thank you very much for sending me all the Makoro, because I sent him many, many more. And then he says, even Moshe Rabbeinu says, Shamati v'shachakti. If Moshe Rabbeinu can make a mistake and say he, say he forgot something, all the more so than other Gedolim. So, uh, and this, this is important. The idea that you're going to say that Rishonim never misquote Sukim, if you say that, then you're left uh, saying that, that they had different versions of Tanakh. Uh, and that, that's definitely not the case. We see that the examples in Rashi, we see examples in the Rambam, where they obviously were quoting from memory. Sometimes it's a manuscript issue. And uh, the misquote, like you saw with Yaakov from Netz, Vivakov is only in the manuscript. But other times we have their, their actual hand, their handwriting. And uh, so they, they cited from memory, as, as Yosef Ibn Kaspi says, I cite this in my book. He says, you shouldn't be surprised by this. Do you think that every time this great rabbi wants to quote a Pusuk, he's gonna go look it up uh, and find it? Uh, they, they cited it. Maybe they assume that the person who reads it will correct it if it's wrong. Uh, that's Simon uh, Kuflamachet. This brings us to Simon Kuflamachet. And this goes back, this is one of the earliest letters. And I'm not, I, I know why I wrote it, but I, I wasn't sure what the motivation was. I, I, know, I know what led up to it, I should say. We, we all know who Wagner is. Here, let me, the big anti-Semite, uh, the great composer. Uh, let's see, Rav ya Yaakov Katz. Um, Yaakov Katz uh, wrote a whole book, uh, The Darker Side of Genius, Richard Wagner's Antisemitism. Well, one of the issues that scholars uh, look at is, uh, is um, do you see the antisemitism coming out in his music or anything like that? There were many Jews who were uh, fans, I guess you could say, of, of Wagner. Um, Israel has never played Wagner, the symphony. They never played Wagner after the war because of the anti-Semitism, the connection, of course, the Holocaust. There's even a direct connection uh, between Hitler and uh, Wagner in that um, Wagner's son-in-law was Houston Stewart Chamberlain, who um, he married the daughter of Wagner. And he, as it says here, has been referred to as Hitler as John the Baptist. Hitler was very much inspired by him, uh, came to see him. Uh, so although uh, Wagner was not what we would call a racial anti-Semitism, a racial anti-Semite, that is, uh, he hated Jews, but uh, occasionally you could have a Jew that Wagner liked. Uh, but Wagner's music was raised during the Nazis to uh, the heights of, um, of authority. And uh, obviously Mendelssohn uh, was uh, degraded as uh, Jewish music. 
I remember when Zubin Mehta, the, um, the conductor, I believe that he was the conductor for um, the Israel um, Philharmonic, uh, they, they put together, they wanted to do Wagner and people, they did it actually. And people got very angry. People sent back their season's tickets. Um, Zubin Mehta, incidentally, um, he's, a, as I recall, he's a Zoroastrian. There aren't that many of them left. Uh, that was the major religion in Babylonia in the days of, um, in the days of Chazal. But um, as I recall, check it now, Zubin, it just occurred to me, Zubin Mehta, is he, um, he's directly a director emeritus. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's, uh, I'm pretty positive that he's, uh, if you look in, um, if I look at uh, Joe Zoroastrian famous people, um, let me just see quickly here. Zubin Mehta, yes, he comes up. Actually, you know, the other one comes up who's even more famous, Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury was a Zoroastrian. If you don't know Zoroastrian is, uh, uh, check it out. But um, they, they, people got very upset. So at the time, Wagner was in the news. If you're, um, if you're a Jew, a good Jew, um, you won't, uh, and, you, and you're not religious, religious Jews wouldn't do this. You wouldn't, for example, play this uh, at your wedding. During the Nazi years, you couldn't even if you wanted to. But I would say if you're a good Jew, you shouldn't blame Mendelssohn either, although he converted as a child, so you, you don't want to blame him, but still he's a Meshumad. But uh, so one, I think they play when they walk down the aisle, the other they play when they go back. Uh, I guess it's Yaakdus. You join together Wagner and the one he hated and despised, uh, Mendelssohn. But so I was interested uh, what, what Rabbi Mazuz thought about the Wagner. I, I, again, why not that I'm going to not listen to Wagner. I happen to like Wagner. Chacham uh, Avad Yosef, when he would listen to one of the, it's recorded one of the, uh, what he thought, anti Semitic uh, Arab musicians, he'd, he'd listen and he'd say, yeah, like, fat, fat. but he listened to the music. But, but I wrote to him and um, he writes back to me that. Uh, in general, the listening to music is problematic because the Chorban, uh, we allow listening to music uh, from the, uh, the radio, but um, so it's not every, but he says, Neginos, the music of this Tame, of Wagner, he says, Pshita upshita sha'asr, it's, for, for, it's forbidden. I, 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 I'm very interested to know what the Orthodox did in Germany. Maybe uh, we have someone of long standing here from, uh, uh, German Orthodox community, Washington Heights. So growing up, if you ever heard anything Wagner, because there are Jews who listen to Wagner and their attitude was, uh, the fact that he hates us, like they still like uh, his music. I don't know in the Orthodox world, uh, if they, we all know they went to the opera, did they go to the Wagner opera? Were they in that cult? Uh, her, Chaim Cohen, in his conversation with Michael Shashar, is I, I think he mentions going to Wagner, if I recall. Uh, but uh, I'd be curious to know about that. But he says it's, it's us, sir. Uh, because because of the Horban, and uh, you don't give a hector, I guess, for, for an anti-Semite. Um, until, he says, listen to this, until God, uh, you know, punishes Germany for what uh, the, the punishment they should receive. And then he says, as yuchnesu amangino tanaro makom akodesh. He says, then, once the uh, Germany receives this punishment, then these tunes could return to a place of holiness. Um, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, uh, I think what it means is that the uh, the punishment when Germany, it's like a capitalistic thing. After Germany receives its punishment, which will serve as a sort of catharsis, I guess, uh, or a cleansing of its evil elements. Uh, so only the holy aspect, uh, namely the inspiration that you can be inspired from this music will be remain and then be admissible. But uh, it, it, this sounds like something Ruff Cook would say. I was shocked. And I think that's what it means. Uh, then once they're punished, once Germany receives its due, then um, the songs will be permissible. Whatever that means. I, I think it has some Kabbalistic significance. I don't know. But uh, let's, uh, let's leave it at there. And then we move to Simon Kuf Mem, page uh, 294. 
this has a few things I'm not going to get into. One, I, I, I wrote to him about um, there was a, a man named David Kazis in, um, who wrote all these articles about uh, rabbis of Tunisia. And I wanted to ask him, who's this David Kazis? And lo and behold, uh, uh, he, <laughs> he says all sorts of bad things. He was the Menahel of the, the Alliance School in uh, Tunis. Uh, so that caused all sorts of problems, led to sp terrible spiritual decline. So I didn't know that, uh, but that's interesting. Uh, and then I asked him the question, as since he's so involved with uh, Piyut and um, Shire Sfarad, what about the fact that, uh, we've mentioned it already, you have these poems written by great figures, medieval figures, that um, homoerotic poems deal with homosexuality. How is it that uh, medieval uh, Spanish poets uh, would write like this? And uh, I, I'm not sure, no one's really sure what to make of it. I shouldn't say no one's really sure. A lot of people think, some people think it was just they're adopting a formula of, of, that the Arabs used, like Shira Shirin. You, you, you'd be no difference if you write that. They write also poems about pretty young girls also. Uh, um, I should say pretty young women, uh, but uh, in those days, women was younger than it is today. So what to make of this? Um, uh, listen, you can read all the scholarship on it, um, Scheindlin, and, uh, but uh, Rabbi Mazu says, has to to think that any of the real Spanish poets were writing it. On the contrary, he, he, he cites that in the work Tachimony, there's uh, 10 uh, songs there cursing a certain evil one who did write like this. So he acknowledges that there at least was one person writing like this, but this is an evil one. But when you think in terms of the poets, the great poets, people like Moshe Ibn Ezra and others, who are, I can't remember if he writes just about homoerotic stuff or just about women, but you have all these sorts of poems. Uh, um, he says that the Chokres Manenu from their own Hiruhei bomb they're writing about this. So then what, what, is, what do you do with these poems? Um, he says that uh, when they speak about the young uh, the young uh, good looking man, it's just uh, a, a nice young man, the Aimbo Dofi, and there's no problem with it, but uh, uh, maybe yes, maybe no, I don't know. Uh, they, you know, they do have poems though where they write about wine, they write about women, they write about men. There's all sorts of weird stuff going on. And I'm prepared to accept that uh, this is just a genre. Just like Shira Shirim you, is a genre, uh, you, you adopt that sort of language as a sort of side. That was how they wrote poetry. So uh, I understand that today we never would write like that, but they were living in a different uh, environment. And um, it, it's hard to imagine that poets living in an Orthodox society would publicly write about uh, forbidden desires and things like that. Uh, uh, it still was a community in which uh, you know, the rabbis had certain control uh, with the community leaders. They, uh, they didn't allow just have keros. I mean, you had problems, obviously. We know in Spain they had problems. They had all sorts of problems with men living with concubines and things like that. But to have uh, people writing about it, it's, uh, it, it's an issue, though. I, I, I don't really know uh, um, what to do if there's one answer that can solve all these problems. Uh, I think... I think uh, Raymond Scheinman, I think, assumes that these are uh, real reflections of what people were thinking, uh, which is fine about some figures you don't know. But when you have Shire Chol, uh, people like Ibn Gabiro and uh, Ibn Ezra's and others, um, it's hard to know uh, what to make of this. But that, that is just a, a short letter. We can't really go into it in detail because I don't, I don't really know enough about it. This is, <laughs> and I don't know what to make of it. Uh, and then I asked him a different question that, uh, the, there was a huge issue in, um, in uh, B'nai Brak about this, uh, but others have written about it. Uh, a rabbi named from Yeshiva's Kisei Rachamim named Rabbi Moshe Levi, unfortunately died young. He wrote, uh, he died uh, in his early 40s, and he probably wrote like 15 books, uh, important works. One of them is Menucha Avats on the laws of Shabbos. And he discussed the issue. It's an old question. Can you kill lice on Shabbos? Well, uh, well Normally, you know, you don't kill insects, or, but um, the Gemara tells us, it says Masachas Shabbos, that you're allowed to kill uh, lice on Shabbos. Why? Because only uh, animals or only living beings that reproduce um, um, together, <laughs> male, female reproduction is forbidden to be killed on Shabbos. But you can kill lice because lice don't reproduce. Lice, uh, they, uh, they come out of your sweat. 
they spontaneously generate, spontaneous generation. The Rambam, by the way, he also accepted spontaneous generation. He's writing in medieval times. So, so the question, therefore, is can you kill lice on Shabbos? Because now today we know that uh, lice uh, doesn't uh, spontaneously reproduce. I mean, you take a microscope and you can see uh, lice eggs. So this question was raised by this Rabbi Levy and uh, B'nai Brock uh, exploded uh, with people saying, what type of heretic are you talking about uh, this matter? And uh, I, I asked Rabbi Mazuz and he just points out that I sent him a number of books. I wanted to know because there are people who say that uh, doesn't matter what Chazal determined to be the halacha, even if we have scientific information differently, we keep it and others thought, Differently, uh, he Rabbi Mazuz even mentions he, he he says I think this is the machokas in the Pachad Yitzchak of Bonfanti, and he's right. This question is first raised in the 18th century. Rabbi Yitzchak Bonfanti raises the question because now we can see that the lice are reproducing. Rabbi Yitzchak Bonfanti thought that we should be machner today, and in our own day there have been people who've said that, as I recall, Rav Kafach says we should not kill lice on Shabbos because now we see. And Chazal were not speaking to us from Nevoah or any Ruach HaKodesh or anything, even a tradition. They were just in line with the best scientists of their day. And now we see that it's incorrect, that even lice eggs reproduce, and therefore we shouldn't kill it. And that is a position held by Polsky. But the majority position is we don't change. And Yitzhak Ampronti, who wanted to be Machner, he sent his tshuva to his teacher, Rabbi Huda Briel. Rabbi Huda Briel says, no, no, we don't change the halacha. The issue of B'nai Brak was that they thought it was heresy to say that the sages might not have all the facts and might have made a decision incorrectly. Rabbi Dessler had a different approach. Rabbi Dessler said, and this also, I think, in B'nai Brak, they might have a problem with it. He said that uh, Chazal, the, well, we have a tradition that you, can't, you, can, you, can, um, you can kill by some Shabbos. The reason for it, however, did not come from tradition. The Chazal tried to come up with a reason, and therefore they, uh, they gave this reason. But the, the, the law doesn't depend on the reason. They just are giving the reason what uh, they were told by scientists. They didn't investigate it. Well, that, that's the assumption we're saying. They didn't investigate it. He said that they just gave a reason, but the reason doesn't bind us. So if you don't like that reason, it doesn't mean you uh, change the halacha. Because there's other reasons that we don't know about. The girl also said that uh, when the sages give reasons for things, don't assume that that's the only reason. There's other reasons. Rav Shimshon Rafael Hirsch, he has a whole letter explaining that the sages were not scientists. They, took, they went to the best scientists of their day, like we go to the best scientists. And if the best scientists of the day said something, then they accepted it. The problem, however, is... So Rav Mazuz doesn't think it's an issue at all. Um, he... Um, he says this is an old dispute, and he writes um, to the people who are attacking Ramosha and Levi, if you're going to attack him, uh, look at what does the Gemara say about if anyone says King David sinned when he didn't, Hareza Toa, he's, he's mistaken. You're not going to call people heretics. It's, uh, there's a lot of extremism there. But I just want to note that uh, I found something which shows you that maybe everyone's wrong, and that Chazal did know. I don't know. And maybe you don't need uh, a microscope because uh, why do I say this? Pirkei Rebbe Lezer. Pirkei Rebbe is a late midrash from the eighth century, maybe ninth century. If you look at chapter twenty-six, he's, it says that uh, it says that uh, when um, Avimelech with Avram, Avimelech, all the uh, we were told that all the uh, because when he took Sarah, everyone in his household, in the cavos, the women became barren. And what does it say? Here we see in Perkei Rebbe which was recorded in the 9th century, 8th century, but it records traditions going back hundreds of years, that they recognize as such a thing as, they, as um, eggs of the lice. So um, the idea that they didn't know about it, uh, we see they did know about it. Uh, it, it. Science made no real changes from the years one to the year 1000. Now, there's no real advances in the sense that uh, significant advances. They, so if they knew something in the eighth century, then they knew it in the fourth century. So uh, none of the Chuvot, as far as I know, that discuss this uh, refer to the Pirkei de Rebbe So uh, I would go with Rabbi Dessler, I think, that uh, the, uh, not Rabbi Dessler, with others who explained that, yes, they knew that there were, uh, they'd say that they, lice, had eggs, how, how they knew about it. Maybe you can see it even with the naked eye. I don't know, or maybe they have a tradition, who knows. But um, 
there's this notion which is put forth by some of the Achronim that if you can't see it, it's as if it doesn't exist. Just like we know with the naked eye. So, um, well, we, we can't see, uh, I mean, one way we can't see, you can, uh, you, if you can't see a bug, you can eat it. The question, the only issue is that they have the big disputes about lettuce and everything, is if you can see it, but you can't see it move. You just see like a piece of dirt. Some say that's a problem, others say it's not. Uh, so uh, we cannot see uh, the two lice uh, create the eggs. Um, if you see the egg, that's not an issue. I mean, if something grows, you can see it, but uh, we cannot see the, the lice uh, join together and then create the, it, it, the, the next egg, the eggs. So if that's the case, uh, it's, it's not, it's not apparent to the human eye, therefore it has no significance. So when they say that any creatures that do not reproduce, male and female, it's not referring to uh, reproduction that can't be seen. It's referring to uh, like a dog and a cat and even maybe ants or something. So that, that seems to me to be the, the best uh, way of dealing with this problem. That it's not the Chazal didn't know. If they didn't know, they didn't know, but that's not the issue. The issue is when they speak about uh, lack of reproduction, they're talking about that you can see. And that would solve the problem with the Pirkei of Eliezer. And that's that the tshuva here. And then we get into the next uh, tshuva. This is the last one we'll do tonight. Page 141, page, sorry, 296, number 141. And this is a very long one. This, you have to first see my letter. I have, what I did is I, I save up all my questions and I send them. So there's my questions and his answers. So um, it begins, I begin by saying that um, I, I don't need you to always reply to my letters because I don't want to cause bitl Torah. But if you look at what I write, then I'll, I'll feel good about that. And I'll skip the first thing I wrote about and I'll go to the second one. And this deals with, my letter deals with this individual. His name is uh, Rabbi, uh, where is he? Uh, Rabbi Moshe Kunitz of Offen. Offen is uh, the German word um, for uh, Buddha. Uh, Buddha Pest used to be divided between Pest and uh, Buddha, and Buddha was called Offen. He was the rabbi in Offen, and uh, he wrote a number of books. He wrote responsa called. Um, there you see it there. He, uh, it says here, and this is, uh, they're selling this by auction. He was a controversial figure as he was both a rabbi great in Torah knowledge as well as an enlightenist, that's not an English word, fluent in secular studies. But that, that's not, they got it wrong here. That's not why he was controversial, really. He was controversial, um, by the way, he wrote it, this book also. This is a famous, most famous work. It's called the Ben Yochai. It's all about Rabbi Shem Ben Yechai. It's a very important work because it shows you every example in, uh, in Halachic, in the Rishonim and the Shulchan Arach that can be traced to the Zohar. But it's also very important. Here's the cave, the cave that uh, Rashbi was in. It's also important because he um, rejects Rav Yaakov Emden. Rav Yaakov Emden argued that the Zohar is, is medieval, it's late, even though it, could, it preserves, he thought it was a holy work, it preserves certain traditions. But the Zohar, as we have it, he thinks is a complete uh, med medieval uh, work with uh, sections that I guess would be ancient in it. And uh, this is a rejection of it. And uh, he goes through page after page. His, um, the Chassam Sofer <laughs> said he'd rather have what Yaakov Enden said uh, than uh, what he said, because uh, what um, his replies are, are just, most of them are completely bogus. A few of them are good, but, um, the very first one is the famous one. The, the Zohar refers to uh, Esnoga, as Sin, as uh, Beit Knesset. And this, what's Esnoga? It's clearly a, a, a word synagogue, uh, that, from the word synagogue that we know it. Uh, so he tries to come up with some crazy etymology. No one really takes that work of Moshe Kunitz seriously. Although his chuvot are quite interesting and his chuvot are important because he preserves one of the only halachic writings of Rav Nassan Adler. In fact, it might be the only halachic letter of Ramesh and Adler is in there. And you have letters in there to, from the big Gedolim as well as from some Haskalah figures, or Moshe Kunitz. If you go to uh, Budapest today, you go to the cemetery, and Moshe Kunitz is buried in the row of the rabbis because he was the Rav of uh, Waffen. He was one of the Gedolim of uh, Budapest. What happened was that uh, 
he's right next to a person named Shimon Oppenheim. People have never heard of Shimon Oppenheim, but I, I, used to take, I take my groups there. We'll go back, God willing, again. And I always tell them that the Hasidim come to this grave of Shimon Oppenheim, which is two over from, uh, as I recall, from uh, Rav Moshe Kunitz. And every time we're there, there's never any Hasidim. Baruch Hashem, the last time we went, we're there, and a whole group of Hasidim come. Why did the Hasidim come? Because this Rav Shimon Oppenheim was a Hasid. But he has on his tombstone, um, in fact, I think some people listening to us now even came with us uh, on that trip, the last Central Europe trip. On the tombstone, it says, whoever comes here and uh, recites a certain prayer, the, um, the, the like, uh, what's the, what does he call the prayer? I forgot, it, it, from Mavari Abaka. It's just like a, a, a Yisker type of prayer. Uh, I will intercede with you in heaven. So this is very unusual. Uh, here you have a guarantee that if you come to the kever and you recite this prayer, he's going to intercede with you. So I guess uh, it can't hurt. But uh, this is, the Hasidim go through Europe, they go to the different graves. They do, we, we go to different sites and we go to some graves, but they go, it's amazing. I found these Hasidim and they're in the most, the big cities, they don't even bother going to the sites. They just go to the Kvarim and uh, this is one of the Kvarim on the stops. They'll go here and then from here, they'll go to Rabbi Shaya, of Karastir, and they'll do all the different graves, and they come there because uh, he says he'll intercede. So Rabosha Kunitz is there. In the 19th century, early 19th century, the reformers, they, they wanted uh, some halachic justification. There was one generation where the reformers wanted halachic uh, backing for their ideas, and then they just became complete reformers. And one of the things they wanted halachic backing for was to play music in a show. And they wrote to Italy, because in Italy they had music. They, in Italy, they actually used uh, uh, music, like the organs in the shul by a non-Jew, but they also wrote to Ramosha Kunitz. There's a reason they didn't ask the rabbis in Germany, because the rabbis in Germany knew what type of people these were. They just were looking for heterim. Uh, but uh, they wrote to Ramosha Kunitz, and uh, Ramosha Kunitz, he wrote an answer. Uh, he just went through the halachic sources. He says, well, if a non-Jew is playing it, what's the problem? It's a shus to shus, as we say, being called mitzvah. It's a, it's a rabbinic prohibition or rabbinic prohibition. You know, in other words, and, and playing an instrument in the first place is rabbinic and having a non-Jew play it is, is, is a double, it's a double remove. So we know that's permissible. Uh, Non-Jews play instruments on Friday night at a wedding. Uh, we have non-Jews light the candles in the shul. So he just looked at it from pure halachic and says, if it's, uh, that if it's positive, then you can do it. Well, when this was published, he was, uh, they, they attacked, no one attacked him in his lifetime as a reformer. And everyone still uh, considered him just a rabbi who was led astray by the reformers who got him in their grip. Uh, but in, by the 20th century, he was regarded as a reformist, which is not true. He's an open-minded rabbi, but he's not a reformist at all. He's a regular rabbi. He's a dayan. He's, he's, he's buried with the, the, with the, he lived and died to die, the dayan and, and in uh, Buddha, and actually later he moved to Pesht, and uh, you see where he's buried, and uh, he was uh, always regarded as uh, a liberal rabbi, but uh, an authentic rabbi. So much so that his reputation took a turn for the worse, that, um, and I say this all in my letter to Rabbi Mazuz, that they removed, if you look in the old Vilna Mishnais, not the new printed one, the ones we all have with the Tosas Yom Tov and the Bartanura, at the, the first volume, right at the beginning of it, you have the biography. He wrote like a, like a biography in, a, in like a play of, uh, of uh, Yudha Nasi. And they only, they take part of it. So they don't do the whole thing, but they include part of his, as I recall, first he has the biography and then he has like a whole play, but he, the biography, they include it. It's in your Vilna Mishnayas, on your bookcases. If you have it, uh, Ramosha Kuhn, it's the biography. They moved, they took it all out because he's a reformer. And I'm writing all this to Rabbi Mazuz because he, he, he cites Rabbi uh, Moshe Kunitz and growing up in Tunis, they would learn his story. And the last thing I mention is something I, I say to Rabbi Mazuz and I began with a quiz question, I'll ask you another question and we'll end. So I write to Rabbi Mazuz, I said, I say if the censors really wanted to, uh, if these people who took out Rabbi Moshe Kunitz's commentary, who know nothing about Rabbi Moshe Kunitz, but if they really wanted to be the censors, then there's something else they could take out. And I said to Rabbi Mazuz, and you yourself called attention to this. Right after Ramosha Kunitz's, um, I think it's right after, not right before. No, right after Ramosha Kunitz's um, biography, 
someone is um, someone's sound is on right after Ramosha Kunitz's uh, biography of uh, Ravi Huna Nasi, there is a uh, uh, a grammar. Because everyone just check, I hear I hear someone's sound. If someone's sound is on, just turned off. I hear a, um, I mean, sorry, there's a grammar of, of Mishnaic Hebrew. And let me show you this. And this will be the last thing we see today. And we'll see if you, who can figure it out what uh, I'm going to show you. So in this grammar, it's by uh, a maskil of, uh, in Vilna or around there uh, called Shomo Levinson. It's called Maimar al Diktoglash on a Mishnah. And you have it in all your texts. In um, the second column over here, he talks about how in the, uh, the Mishnah, they, you see already usages of Aramaic. What do I mean usages of Aramaic? Well, they use Aramaic words, putting it into Hebrew. So for instance, the word Beit Tefillah, house of prayer, in Aramaic, it's called Beit, Beit Knista, And then that comes back into Hebrew as Beit Knesset. That's what he's saying. And he gives a number of examples of where Words in Aramaic are brought back into Hebrew through the Aramaic. Um, the word matsoi is because of the word shriach. Uh, uh, and then he gives this example right here. He says, uh, also say the word levad. The, the, in biblical Hebrew, it, 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 you'd have the word, uh, um, you know, instead you say in the Mishnah, you have the word chutz instead of levad. Why not levad alone? You know, this person, you would say this person, not those people, he said, alone from those people, you do words, use the word levat, and that would be the biblical word. But instead of that, they use the word chutz. Now, why do they use the word chutz? He says, because in Aramaic, you have the word bar. Bar means, the word bar means outside, but it also, like in, uh, but it also means um, uh, separated from. So, for example, with the word, um, so, so when you take it back into Hebrew, bar means outside, that means chutz, but it also means like separated, not just outside, like living outside your house, chutz me I mean, you also say, mi chutz la machane, so uh, separated from everyone else. So again, the word chutz is not a biblical Hebrew word. It's, uh, but the word bar in Aramaic, he's saying, refers to outside. So then it becomes in Hebrew, both usages, outside, let's say outside a house, but also outside, you know, outside of us, our group. And then he said, so in the note, look in the note, and this is, let's see, you can figure it out. Um, he says, remember that the word chutz is not a biblical Hebrew word. He says, Vim sasham pamachat. you'll find it one time in the book of Kohelis. And he cites the verse uh, here in Kohelis. Here's the verse. He cites it chapter three. It's really chapter two. Uh, it's a mistake here. Let's see. Um, where is it? Um, I gotta search quickly here. Where is it? Uh, hold on. I didn't write it down. Ah, yes, here in verse uh, 25. Take a look. Um, what does the verse say? For who will eat or who will enjoy apart from me? So uh, here you have the, the word used in biblical Hebrew, chutz meaning levat. So let's go back to what he says now. Uh, where is he? Uh, ah. So he says, you'll find it one time in the Bible, in this pasuk, chutz mimani. Then he says, You'll find other places in this book, many other examples of uh, forms of language, that are in line with this principle we're talking about, Aramaic, back into Hebrew. And he says, the reason for this is known to the people who are um, the intelligent. Okay, class. What is he referring to? What does he mean? What is the Tam Yadua? The Maskilayam. That you'll find in Kohelis, the, um, these um, Aramaic forms back into Hebrew. Who's going to tell us? Tam Yadua, the Maskilayam. 
What he's hinting to, but not saying explicitly, is that this is the proof that Kohelis is a later work, not written by Shlomo HaMelech, because Shlomo HaMelech wouldn't use uh, these Aramaic terms. So he says that the word chutz is not found at all in Tanakh, except in Kohelis, and you also find other examples where these Aramaic forms are put back into Hebrew. And the reason for that is, no, he doesn't want to spell it out, but those who know understand, namely that Kohelis is really not uh, Solomonic, but is a much later work when they already did Aramaic. Now, Rabbi Mazuz was the one who pointed it out, but if so, I said to him, if the censors understood this, that's what they should censor. The, but that's in every one of your Mishnayases, and yet Moshe Kunitz is very kosher, nice biography of um, Yehuda Nasi, that's been removed, but this, this uh, semi-kfira is, uh, it still remains there. So we'll end with that. We're in the middle of my letter, and uh, as I said, next class, we'll deal with Kalman Shulman, the mosque, we'll deal with Gilgal, and with the Rishash, or Shmuel Strashun has to write about it, it's more more good stuff, and if we... Um, and next week also will be devoted to Rabbi Mazuz, a number of interesting stuff. And then we'll turn to some new figures and wait till you get to Rav Herschel Schechter. We're coming to some great stuff from him as well. So let me take the questions and comments. We've gone over time a bit. Uh, let's see. Susanna says that how Scala changed Ashkenazic attitudes towards grammar, if I'm not mistaken. You're absolutely correct. They, they even gave the example. They said that we used to be able to offer a sacrifice on a Bama. But when the... Uh, now we can't. Same thing with Haskalah. We said when the Haskalah used to be kosher, when the maskilim started doing it, it's non-kosher. But today there's no more maskilim. So then <laughs> no one's doing that. The maskilim were saying, you don't need to learn Gemara. It's better to learn Tanakh and Diktuk. This is just Diktuk. They stopped, this, the Ashkenazim stopped learning Tanakh. Hirsch, in, in the 19th letters, he attacks this idea, which he calls misguided, that uh, you shouldn't have to learn Tanakh anymore. But this, it became popular. Uh, that uh, we don't need to do that. But today, then these people don't exist anymore. So we should, that, therefore, in the Ashkenazic world, even you have a return to Tiktok and things like that. Uh, Rabbi Kelman says, the attitude to speaking Hebrew, Zionism, studying Tanakh. Uh, yeah, it, this was all because of the, uh, the Haskalah. Uh, Baruch meant the common, uh, the common pronunciation of Sheker and MS are wrong, should be switched. Ashkayach to Baruch. David said, the boxer turned entrepreneur. Actually, Rafael Halpern wasn't a boxer. He was a wrestler. Although if you read all the essays on him, it says he didn't want to do fake wrestling, even though that's all, this is all fake wrestling. He, he would actually do what he wanted to do, even if he's supposed to take a dive, he didn't care. And uh, um, it, it was all, yes, yeah, so he came to America. It was all fake, but he refused to go along with it. So uh, apparently with him, it was half real, uh, half fake. Uh, Well, okay, I didn't say Sheker, not Sheker, she Emmet. Well, um, you ask, what about the uh, the rule of, uh, a good question, of Segolio. So now I have my uh, dictionary here, because it's easier to look up this and show you. Uh, well, actually, do I have my sitter here? Uh, MS Amuna. Now, I have a prayer book here. Uh, I got the Machsar here, the Birnbaum Machsar. So let me look in Myriv on, um, Rosh Hashanah, if you look at MS, MS, this is to, um, who is it writing? Oh, is, oh, I don't even need to look. I should look down. Susanna pointed it out. It has a chataf segel, not a segel. So there you go. A chataf segel is really a, a shava. So I'm sorry, Susanna, for not reading the next thing. I wonder if I had to pull it off my chaf. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's not a sheker, it is. Uh, you wouldn't say, uh, you can't say sheker. Sheker is like any other word, Dago. Uh, they all have the, uh, it's the tall Mila El, but Emet, it's Emet because it's not, uh, it's not a single. So there you go. Uh, Barry says, my mother, Allah Shalom, Shalom, told me how she met a uh, father, young Israel dances. I've met people, I met one person in particular who told me that, and many others told me about people they know. Uh, yes, that was, that was the era. Um, I don't want to say it, people, Ramaz graduates will be upset. Ramaz actually had, you see this in Jeffrey Gurak's book on Ramaz. They had classes into the 50s, as far as I know, maybe even later, social dancing classes. You would learn the foxtrot there. They actually had these classes. Uh, and uh, Rabbi Lukstein, you said, told us somewhere, he did actions to bring Jews back to Yiddishkeit. Yeah, that's what they did in Ramaz. Um, Baruch says, the Chacham of Adi all Sephardim should follow Rav Yosef Karo. Well, yes, we've spoken about this. We've we've dealt with it, and that's exactly Rabbi Mazuz's point. He doesn't think you need to follow uh, 
uh, Rav Yosef Karo, if you have a tradition in Tunisia, although in one area he actually, he went along with Rav Vadia because he doesn't think it's such a, an important thing, and that's with standing up for Aserus Adibros. In Tunisia and in Morocco, they all stood up for Aserus Adibros. So Mazus says, now that we're in Israel, we can go along with this. It's not, it's not really a minhug that we have to stick with, but others, you're right. Um, Baruch says the general phenomenon, the closer you are, the need to distinguish oneself, uh, there's differences. In the modern Orthodox world, there's fighting between YU and YCT, and that, it was greater than between Haredim and YCT. That is also true. The centrist attacks on YCT, because they feel threatened, because it's their territory, was harsher than the Haredi attacks. Uh, exactly, that is true. Uh, and Susanna says, you think that the Israel Philharmonic is reconsidering the decision not to play Wagner's music. Uh, they did play Wagner. I remember they, no, they did play Wagner in Israel once. You can look it up and it caused a huge um, a controversy over that. Uh, Wagner, he was an anti-Semite, but that's not why they're not playing him. They're not playing him because of his connection to Nazi Germany. Um, that he was the, the, um, the, the, the musician laureate, I guess you could say, and he was symbolic of Nazi Germany. That's the reason. There's plenty of other uh, composers who were anti-Semites. That's not... Uh, um, David says, as a proof text for Mazuz's assertion that the hatred of Haredim to other Haredim is greater than the hatred of the secular towards the Haredim, is the Gemara and Pesach in 49b, the hatred of a Torah scholar who abandoned Torah towards Torah scholars is worse than that of the Yamei Aretz. The, um, um, Rabbi, uh, I don't know, David, if you're looking in the book, in the Sefer itself, I cite this in the note that that's, um, and uh, Rabbi Mazuz himself cites this explicitly in another one of, in another place. But, um, but you're right, that's a good point that the, um, the hatred of the Torah scholar there who abandoned Torah. <laughs> uh, well, Daniel says in December, 1991, the Israeli Pharmonic voted to play Wagner. I don't know, actually, you're right. Take that back what I said, Daniel. I, I, I think they, stayed, they voted to do it, but they never did. That's what it is. And because people were starting sending back their season tickets. It was right around then in 1991 that I wrote, it was such a big controversy. And I wrote to him about that. David says that one of Rav Kunitz's chuvas was that Moa who does not have medical training and not perform Brit Mila. And he actually cites a Rashi that says it's better to, be a, to have medical training on it. Uh, but that's the, an article came out about 10 years ago or 15 years ago where a guy attacking Ramosha Kunitz like he's some reformer and he cites that and he cites other things. Ramosha Kunitz was simply like a modern Orthodox type of rabbi. He was, um, and um, he, it'd be better if Amoa uh, was also a doctor. They don't have to be, but if they are, that's even better. Ah, so then Michael says, what about Pink Floyd's music, given Roger Walter's rabid anti-Semitism? Question is, uh, would Ramazuz even acknowledge that you can, uh, at the end of days, can you get something good out of it? Uh, I don't know, uh, classical music has a separate place. Uh, the Vilna Gon said that music is a chokhmah. It's one of the chokhmahs. We know, well, Levi, tribe of Levi, we speak about the creation of music in Parsha Sprechis, but they're not referring to, uh, uh, they're not referring to, uh, I guess, uh, modern Pink Floyd type of music. We're talking about, uh, you know, great music, I think. David says, Chutz appears at least three times in the Chumash, let alone other Navi. But in that, in that way, in that exact same form, uh, in place of Levad, it has to be used in place of Levad, David. That's what we're talking about. Not, let's say, outside in the sense... Uh, outside, but uh, separated from uh, Levad alone, that sort of thing. Uh, um, and okay, and let me point out one thing. I because uh, I, I can't get rid of my gear to the Ankusa. I grew up always saying Samson Raphael Hirsch and Shimshon Raphael Hirsch because, after all, the name is Shimshon. But the truth is, and I heard this years ago and it never really stuck with me, but uh, I recently heard it again by the authority that um, uh, Rabbi Hamburger it was passed on to me by one of our listeners, his name really isn't Shimshon. Even though in, in Israel today, he's called Shimshon. His name is Shamshon. That was his, that's how he was called up to the Torah. Now you're gonna say, well, Shamshon isn't a name. Uh, well, uh, it's, it's not a Hebrew name. It's a Hebraic type of name, but uh, we have uh, all sorts of names that are Wolf. People are called up to the Torah Zev Wolf. Wolf isn't a name either. And uh, we have these names that are um, 
Maimon. The Rambam's father's name is Maimon. Maimon is not a Hebrew word, but that's his name. And that's what he was called up to the Torah. They didn't have, uh, so Rav Shimshon Rafa Hirsch, his name is Shamshon. So from now on, if I can remember, I'll say Rav Shamshon Rafa Hirsch. Uh, it's not just that in German he's saying it, that's what they gave him. Now, why they gave him, we haven't yet been able to determine why it's, it became that, other than that's just what it became in, in Germany. Germany had some interesting names. Um, ah, so David says Wagner was played in Tel Aviv in 1981 and a Holocaust survivor stormed the stage, but I was not, that wasn't what I was referring to, that's before my time. Oh. Uh, okay, and David says that, that no, when chutz is used earlier, I wasn't clear when I said, I, I, I don't think I was clear. I was making it seem like chutz never appears. What I meant to say, it does, never appears as, um, as I'll show you just, this will be the last thing, um, as Levad. Here it is. You can check it out later. Tachas milas Levad chutz. And then he goes on to explain that uh, whole thing. So the only place we find it is uh, in uh, Kohelis. Um, so uh, thank you all, and please correct me if I say again, Rabbi Shimshon Rathal Hirsch is uh, Shamshin. In, in Germany, they would call him, even the rabbis refer to him as Hirsch. They didn't feel that you need to call him Rav Hirsch, Rav Hirsch. Uh, his name wasn't uh, Rafael Hirsch either. That was his father's name. As you, when we go to the Kever in, uh, in Frankfurt, Shimshon Ben, Shimshon ben Rafael Hirsch's last name was Hamburger. And that's what I thought you were going to say. His name was actually Hamburger, Sh Shamshon, whatever Hamburger. I don't know if you ever used that name. It's, you know, if you remember on the Kever, it's Shimshon uh, a Frankfurter. I thought it was Hamburger. No, I think it's. Well, I, don't, I don't think he ever used that name, though. Uh, no, but on the Kever, it says Shimshon Ben. Rafal Hirsch Hamburger. In other words, Rafal yeah, Hirsch was his father. He wasn't Rafal Hirsch, that was his father. And that's also the only grave, if I'm sure you remember, the only grave I've ever seen in my life that has at the bottom Taf Nun Sadiq. Uh, no, no, no. Let me show him. Sadiq, Nun Sadiq Beit Hay. There we go. Oh, yeah, we go. Yeah, let, yeah, show us Kever. There, it is, uh, there it is, uh, Rabbi Shamshon Ben Morin Rarav Rafal Hirsch, Frankfurt. Uh, the Av Basin, and uh, what were you referring to, Rabbi Kelman? Okay, so look at the bottom. It's Nun Sadiq Beit Hay. There's no tough. Yeah. There's no Tehay. Yeah, his wife has there, it. There, was, there, no, there it was, was no doubt that Shem Shem Valhurs was going to Gan yeah. Eden. So yeah. they didn't have to write Tehay. That's uh, for normal people, but Shem Shem Valhurs, Nishvat Remember when, when we, we were there, there together on our first trip ever? No, not our first trip, but our trip to, you know, our... Um, our Germany trip, Germany. that's where we were. And uh, it's pretty, pretty mind boggling. But his wife is next to him. I yeah. seem to remember Hamburger. So why did I, why am I getting that wrong? But it's yeah. she jumped in Rafael Hirsch. Yeah. But um, anyways, okay. very well, interesting. Thank you all. Final words from Rabbi uh, Kelman. Those were pretty much the final words. Okay, tomorrow. I mean, that's just uh, to, you know, discuss. Listen, my uncle was also Wolf. Zev Wolf, that's uh, my uncle, Zev, who you know, you know, you know very well. Uh, but uh, we called him Wolf, his name was Velvo. But uh, talking about that, the other name too. But that's fascinating with uh, Rafal Hirsch. Anyways, okay. Um, okay, thank you very much. Tomorrow morning, like I said, right at the beginning, Benny Gazunte at 12.15, our regular shear at Tehillim. And that is followed at 1.30 by Yosef Arubo kicking off a five-part series on Shir Hashirim. Okay. Um, say, before you go on, I, I think what you're thinking of, because um, the reason you thought that is because uh, he was born in Hamburg, although- I know, but well, I-, I he, has, he has a grandfather named Frankfurt. Yeah. But that, I, thought uh, I, I thought that was on the cover, but I guess I was wrong. That's what, that's what I thought of. But, but I clear, I remember the Nishmatot Shura without the Tehei, and of course that it's his- Oh, father. Wait, hold on, hold on. Baruch's- um, Baruch's correctly pointing out something. I, I made a mistake um, on the kever itself. Uh, I'll yeah, let's go back to the kever and blow yeah. it up and see what it looks like again. Yeah, no, no, it's, um, that's, um, I, I was wrong in what I said. It's not, uh, here, I'll pull it up for you again. Um, uh, hold on a second, I'm pulling it up. Um, where are we here? There we go. Um, yeah, it's not, uh, it's it's Pei Fei there, stands for Frankfurter. That's his grandfather's uh, name. Um, Where does it say Frankfurter? Pei Pei. It doesn't mean Frankfurt, yeah. even though he was rabbi in Frankfurt. They're attaching his name to him. Um, 
but uh, I, he was never, he never wrote it by that name, but uh, he never wrote anything, but that was his, uh, his grandfather's name. I don't even know if his father used the name, hey, 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 you see after Hirsch, it yeah. says, hey, hey. Go, that's go down a little bit, I just want to see the rest of it. That's what it refers yeah. to as Frankfurter. Although that's very, and it says, I remember he died on a Friday, I think, on December 31st, if I'm not mistaken, 1888. Uh, it says when he died, he was buried on the Sunday. Is that there? Yeah. No. Yes, he, you know, he died. Um, okay. Okay. So maybe that's his wife. He next came story. the next day, he's buried Gimel. Right. So, so, okay, well, so thank you, Baruch, for that. Uh, it's, a, um, that uh, you're right, they're putting Frankfurter, but I don't know, uh, as far as I know, maybe... Uh, our Washington Heights person can help us. I, I, I don't think he ever wrote, called himself that. And his, I don't know if his father ever did, but uh, that was his grandfather's name. Yeah. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, thank you. Well, okay. anything else, Rabbi, any final words? Or that's thank it. you. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you, you, you next week. Please, God. And uh, all right, everybody, I think there, I guess there's snowstorms all over, we're expecting. So uh, keep people inside.